Okay, part two, equilibrium of a system of coplanar forces. In the first video, what we did was we looked at the problems in these uh, example notes that I've got for you and how they were done analytically. Analytically basically just means using maths and that was to use these formulas, the horizontal and vertical summation formula and the moment formula, ensuring that everything's in equilibrium and that way you can determine reactions by making sure it balances. So that was video number one. This time what I'm going to do is go back to those same two problems. That's the two that are on these pages here. So the first one was the one at the bottom of this page and the one with the angle coming in in the next two pages. But we're going to do them graphically. And graphically is actually, for me anyway, it's something I like to do because I can see things very quickly graphically. So I tend to use them as a first line of attack so that I can prove how this is going to work. A lot of engineers will do the same thing. They'll do something graphically to get a head around the problem and visualize what's going on and it does help you focus. If you want accuracy, of course the mathematics is going to be more accurate. Graphical solutions are always going to suffer from scale. Um, you cannot get everything to be so precise. Remember what we said when we did this before when we were doing force diagrams. The bigger the diagram, the bigger the scale, the more likely it is that it's going to become close in accuracy. Expect an accuracy of within 10% range, that's five either side, and you pr probably, that's, that's an acceptable thing. You, you use a graphical solution to help you get your head around the problem, or just to prove it, just to say this is what it really should be like, and, and you can check your mathematics or do it either way. The method that's been invented for this, it's a very ancient, not ancient, it's a couple hundred years old, so if you like to call ancient 100 years, called a resolution of a system of coplanar forces using the funicular polygon method. Now basically funicular is just a um, Latin word, from, I think it's Latin, for um, string. Um, polygon of course we know is a shape, a many sided shape. So we're using something that has many shapes and many sides and has something called strings in it. And you'll see what that's all about. But there's another one of those great lines for parties if you go to those sorts of parties. So what you do first is you have a look at the problem. So you've got to go back and find the first of these two problems. It's the one on the bottom of this page. And you're always provided with the space diagram. The space diagram, again, has all of the information and a lot of extra information. Uh, it may even have things like how the structure works. It might even have things about its color. It might even have a picture of a truck driving across it. All of those things are, are, re are relevant only in giving you the idea of what's going on. What we're really interested in is what are the forces doing? And um, what are the distances involved in the forces? So the first thing we do is create our free body diagram. Now this free body diagram here may not be to scale. So for these problems, for any graphical solution, you need to do them to scale. So I've got one already done for this one. So I'll just grab that from up the back here where I've prepared it. And we'll put that down in shot. So I hope that's in good shot for you there. And I've left a little space over there, as you'll see, and we'll be working in that space in a moment. So essentially what I've done is drawn to scale this question. Now you can see already that it looks different, but that's only because maybe this is to scale. My lines here are longer. So if I'd drawn them shorter, that's different in size, probably. Pretty close, but yeah, well, it actually is very close. But all I've done is make larger arrowheads. So as long as they are the right distances, and in this particular one, I think what I finished up making was that, yeah, I've made two centimetres equal to one metre. So here's the distance one metre, and here on my rule I've done two centimetres equal to one metre. You can choose a scale of your own to do that. It will fit on your page. I'm using an A3 sheet here, so I've got plenty of room. If you want to put this into your books, you might have to make it slightly smaller. But remember, every time you make things small in a graphical solution, you are lowering your... Um, accuracy level. You know, it's the limit of reading thing that you have a problem with. So it's very hard to tell really accurately points of, points of a millimetre or points of a newton that way. I know because, I know I said to you in the last video that you should put the squiggly line in. That's the one that's provided here. But because I know there's only vertical ones, in my case here, I've just gone, let's keep it simple. I've got an RV, R, a vertical here, an RAV, reaction A vertical. I've got a reaction B vertical. I've got a 7 coming down, a 9 coming down, an 8 coming down at their right points. Now, this is where it gets a little interesting. So I'm going to leave this for a second and show you where the idea generates from of what a funicular polygon is all about. And we'll come back to this sheet. 
Also, last time I was putting pieces of paper down here, I went right through those under the desk, so I'm putting a few extras down this time. I don't want to get into trouble for not, not having a clean desk at the end of it all. All right, now I'm just going to sketch this out and see if you can follow with me. Let's take a nice, simple problem, a beam that is simply loaded, and we did one of these in the first video, nice and simple, 10 newtons, that made this five, and this was five as well, because the distance here was one, and the distance here was one. Everything's balanced. There's no turning effect happening because they're balancing each other. By the way, if that wasn't there, or the, if you held one of these, there is a turning effect, but the reality is they're all balancing up anyway because they're all going to create that. So if I held there, there's gonna be a turning effect, but if I hold here, it balances it out. That was something from last time. Now, what the idea is, that if you draw the force diagram for this, what will it look like? Now, a force diagram, if you recall from what we've done earlier, is when you add all the forces head to tail. So if I had a force that went up like this, and then another plus another force that went across like this, and then perhaps another force that went straight down, all right? Remember we did this way back at the beginning of the preliminary course, uh, when we're looking at vectors and you did them to scale, so you added that on, and then you put them head to tail, and then you brought it down, right? And then the final thing was the reaction, or the resultant of those four forces, the three forces, is that one there, that's the resultant. All right, going that way. But if you wanted to get an equilibrium for it, the equilibrium would be the opposite of the resultant. So there'd be a force coming back this way, making the whole thing close up, cancels it out. And that's your force polygon. So here you go, force polygon. Yeah, so polygon just means multi-sided, regular shape, right, with straight lines. So if I do the force diagram for this to create a polygon, it's not a polygon. It is, but it isn't. Think it through. 10 goes down to scale. Where does the five start? Five starts at the end, because this is head to tail, head to tail. So you go five goes back up, halfway, because it's five. And then the next five, the other five, will go the remainder of the halfway. So we do finish up coming back to the starting point. So we do have equilibrium, it cancels itself out. So we've got 10 going down and two fives coming back up. But because their lines of action are exactly the same, it doesn't create an open space. There's no gap between them. They're just on the same line. Hopefully that's not too difficult to spot. It's still a polygon, weirdly enough. Now, here's the cool thing. It was observed that if you were to put a line or a dot rather, anywhere else, anywhere, and in this case, I'm just gonna do the first one so it's obvious, say along a line that's horizontal to that. So straight out here. Right, so that's supposed to be vertical across, or horizontal across there. And then if I drew two lines, to the top here, and I labelled them A, B, and C, just for argument's sake. There. Now, those things there do something odd when you come over and look at the force diagram here, or the free body diagram that's been done to scale. If I extend the lines of action, create lines of action, and then I take just one of those lines, this B one, and I draw it in, All right, that's B, and then if I take any of the other two lines, A, keep that angle exactly the same. So I spring that angle across. It should start to be obvious, shouldn't it? And this one here comes across. I've created an isosceles triangle because that side there and that side there, well, this is C now, they're the same length. That one there and that one there, same length. Particularly if, that, well, if that's in the middle, that's gonna happen as a triangle. And here's another point. If I put point here, then we'll call this point P, because we're gonna be calling it point P from here on in. If I put my point P in a different place, this should be obvious too. If I take that line across at the angle that A is, it climbs a bit steeper, and that one here climbs a bit steeper, but it still finishes up creating that triangle. So there's a triangle here that actually creates a division now, what I mean by division is that, let's say, for example, I start with the triangle. 
Let me try that. I start with my triangle. I draw my force diagram in. I've got a 10 going down. I'll just have that 10 for the moment. And I put in a B. Well, actually, let's be careful here now. This is where it gets a bit tricky because it's the forces are in between lines. So here, this, if we look at this, the A here, in both of those cases, the long one or the short one, the A is between one of the forces coming up. So let's make it logical. Let's put the R, A, V here, like we've done, R, B, V here. And let's, let's call this one R, A, B, V, and this one R, A, V. So that A goes between the 10, which is the one going down, so there's the start of the 10, and the end of the RB. So it's start of the 10, the end of the RBV. So A goes between the 10 and the RBV. Runs between the 10, the line of action of the 10, and the line of action of the RBV. That is why that one's there. This one here, going straight across, goes between the RBV, the end of the RBV, or the end of the RAV, and the start of the RBV. I know it's starting to sound like I'm talking gobbledygook with these languages and the different letters, but you've got to get used to it. RBV starts there, RAV ends there. B goes between that line of action and that line of action, between the two forces involved. C now concludes that and comes back up by being between RAV and the end of the 10, coming down. So it goes between RAV and back up to the 10. Now why that's important is that if I then go backwards, so if I put in, say let's put in the C from the end and go out backwards, and then I put in the A from the other end from here. So I'm working backwards actually, I'm creating this diagram from this diagram. Then the line that's left, this one, splits the 10 in half, because it's a right angle, because it's horizontal. All right. Now that might not seem like very much of a trick. Okay, you've just drawn a whole bunch of squiggly lines all over the place that somehow make sense to you, but not to me. All right, let's do something completely different with that. Take all that information, create an offset one. So this time we'll put the 10 over to one side. Lines of action are still vertical. Still got R, A, V, and still R, B, V. The 10 now is not in the center, but it's to scale. Let's say that's one and that's two. It might not be, but just for a, so that it looks like we've got some numbers on it. If we extend the lines of action, come down, come down, just extend the lines of action. Now we go over and we draw in the only thing we know. We have no idea how big these are in the previous one because it's in the middle we knew they were five because it's in the middle. But now, because it's not in the middle, you could calculate it, you could probably work it out because you know it's going to be two thirds on one side, one third on the other. But let's not do it analytically, we're going to do it graphically. So I probably shouldn't have put those numbers there and made it so easy. Um, but anyway, what I'm going to do now is just draw the 10 going down to scale. So I've got that to scale. And that's important, that has to be to scale as well, it won't work. Now I can just put in lines. Even if I did the same lines I did before, let's put a horizontal line across. Problem, if I put in the same angles, they're not gonna meet in the middle. So I'll just pick a point anywhere here and I'll go up and go across, all right? Now what I've done here is I've created a triangle that isn't an isosceles triangle, but it's still gonna represent the angles of the two, thing, two, two things we had before. Now I think I called that one A before, this was B and that's C. So let's go back to the same thing. So now if I got my B in, I can go back, well I can't actually because I don't know where B starts. I don't know where it is. I can't put it in the middle because I don't know it's in the middle. But what I do know is RA and RC start from the ends that I do know. And in this, the one before, RAV started with C and went to 10. So if I put this in the same angle, so that's my C going up. And this time get the A and bring the A across and I slope a, a, a little less of an angle like that. That line now, when it comes in here, that's A 
and that's B, guess what? That is. That's one unit and that's two units because it's triangular and they're similar triangles. We're using the same angles in here. That angle in there, it's the same as that angle in there. So we've actually divided the force up by doing a component of it in so it's a quick way of finding a third. In, that, in this situation, it was a third. So now what I can do is measure that to scale, and I will know the size of the RB. Oh, this, now, let's go back to that. Which one's this coming from? It's kind of C is coming from RA. So that's RAV. And the, the A is coming from RB. So this part here is RBV. That's how I can tell the different sizes. Now, when I look at this, I can see that the majority of the load is on this side. It's heavier over here. There's more of it over here. So therefore, that's logically going to work. This is going to be the small force, and this is going to be the big force reacting to that. But can you see how that worked? That I've actually created a triangle that goes over to this diagram, and that helped me divide that into a half. Now, that's going to be the key. I can use either coming from this diagram like I did the first time to this one, or I can go from this one back to that one, provided I have enough information in there from the lines of action. Now I've said all of that to just get to one point, and that is to the solution of the problem we have at hand. And this time we're going to do it a little bit more accurately using that same idea. All right? So now back to the original, which I've got there as the force free body diagram to scale. So the first thing I have to do, and I'll just get a thinner pencil pen here. I actually could use pencil because it won't matter. And you're going to need to get two set squares again. Now the reason you need the two set squares is that we're going to need to transfer parallel lines. And remember how I showed you that if you, for example, want vertical lines, I can put two set squares together as long as I get my vertical correct of one. Now actually, I've got a line over here for me to get my vertical off. I've got it in pencil there. I'm going to use that as my force diagram in a second. So just to be sure that I'm all the same, I can slide, hold one set square and slide the other one along. It's like your T square and set square working together again in the drawing room. Extend the line of action of each one of these forces. Now for the moment, you don't exactly know how big you want to extend the lines of action. But you do know that you're going to use an area underneath here. That's one of the reasons why I drew it up the top there out of the road, because I knew I was going to eventually want to use the space down here. Now the big deal now is I need to draw my force diagram. My force diagram comes from the free body diagram. I'm going to draw it over here. Remember what we're doing is drawing all the forces head to tail. In the previous one I only had one 10 going down, but here what I've got is an 8, a 9 and a 7. So I put them in and I've got that line of action over here ready to go. So I'm going to actually use a simple system because I'm, I've already thought this one through. Um, and one, one centimetre can equal one kilonewton. And so that makes the scale nice and easy. Let's move myself so I can read it. If I do the eight first, logically, come across, there's the eight. Then go to the nine, so nine onto eight. So I can come down and measure it or I can just add it up as I'm going. I like to do it by moving them and making sure I'm reading the right numbers. Because if I do a math, if I make the mistake, if I, for example, come up with 16 and I put 16 straight away, I'm wrong. So you should just keep that in mind. And here we go to the seven. And I need to extend the line just a fraction to get to the seven. All right, so now what I'll do, just so that we can see that a bit more on the camera, is I will put those in and Put the arrowhead there because I'm going to lose it if I go over it in a minute. Right. That's the full total of all forces. So there's a one to there, seven, one to there, eight rather, and then the seven finishes the whole thing off. So if we put next to it, eight, the nine, and then the seven. Okay. Now in those other diagrams, oh, just bumped the camera. Sorry about that. Yeah, we're still in line. All good. Nope, oh, did it again. Uh, right. yep. It's hard to work around. I've got a leg of the tripod sitting right in front of me here that you can't see. Okay, so with these guys, what I did was found a point called P out here somewhere and drew lines to it. Now I can either, 
for the example of this one, find, just draw a line in, or I can, let's start with something. I can, let's go the other way this time. Let's put in a point P way over here. So it really doesn't matter where it is. Okay. Now, just to prove you can go in any direction, I could draw it over here first and move them back. But I'm gonna do them this way, just to show that you can do it both ways. Now, for the purpose of this, I'm, I'm going to um, put these in in green. Hopefully, it'll come out green. All right, that's one line or one string, funicular. Hence, the funicular polygon. Can't remember. I said in the other video I wasn't sure whether it's Italian or Latin. I should have looked it up. Maybe you could look it up and tell me. I think uh, doesn't um, uh, cable cars in in Italy called funicular? I think or something like that. Okay. Um, label it like we did before. Call that A. Call that B. Call that C. Call that D. And there's something missing. There's the last of those strings that we've got to put in, which is going to divide R, A, B, and R, B, V from each other. So that we'll find in a moment. How? All right. Eight starts there. Let's make that the end of R, B, V. So R, B, V is coming up and finishing there. So that's R, B, V finishing. That means that this is the start of R, A, V. Now why I need to know that is that string has to be drawn between the line of action of that eight and R, B, V way over here. So that looks really weird. It's gonna go right across here. But what I'm trying to prove to you is it doesn't really matter. You can do this by drawing a triangle up here. It won't be a triangle, will it? Can't be a triangle this time because it's got more than one side, or more than three sides, rather. So I'm going to get that and try to slide that over. Now, this is just going to take a moment of jiggly juggling. Doctor Who-ish then. Wibbly wobbly. Jiggly juggling. All right. Okay. Now, that's not going to work for me. So I'm going to slide that to there, so it's still parallel, and then change my position so I can slide down. Now you're going to look at that and go, what did he just do? You think it through. This is still parallel to that. I just slid it over a little bit and then dropped it down by using my T-squares, or my set-squares together. And here I'm going to just start anywhere. It really doesn't matter where I start. I could start up there, I could start further down. In the next problem, next video, you'll see why it's important to start there. But for this one, it doesn't matter. That is A. Parallel, just transferred across. And it's gone from eight to RBV, to RBV. Now I'm gonna leave that one alone now. That's not important to me anymore because I'm gonna use that later. But what's now important is B. B is between the eight and the nine, between eight and nine. So now if I go around and get, and get B parallel, good. Might be able to move this one straight across this time. Looks like it's gonna fit. Put my set squares together. Slide that down, yep. Now because it's between the eight and the nine, it's only a short line this time. This goes in there. Go B, parallel. The big deal is it's between the eight and the nine. So the string goes from the line of action of the eight to the line of action of the nine. I hope that green's showing up. It's a bit light. Might have to go over it later, but anyway. Okay, so now we're at the nine. We're there. Go down the nine, and the next force is the seven. And the line of action is C. Or the line of action, the string is C. So I'm going to go now and take... Now, let's see how this one's going to work. Probably go with that right there. Keep that set square there. Line it up. Put that one down the bottom here. That's still in shot. If it's not, you can see I'm working it. I'm going to slide that up until I take the B that I finished here and go up. And that's C. 
So I've gone upwards, parallel this time, between the nine and the seven. Nine and the seven. All right. Hopefully it's making sense and you can say, okay, the D is going to go between the seven and over here to the RAV, because that's the RAV starting point. And so let's go down here and grab that one. Right. Hope when I knock the camera, I haven't taken too much out of shot. I haven't had time to check it. So I hate to have to do the whole thing all over again just because I knocked the camera a bit. All right. There is the line of action. Oh, I'm sorry to the line of action. That's the line of action. That's the string that came out a bit darker. That's D. Now, it shouldn't take too much to work out that there are two points that aren't joined. And so that we can tell the difference. This is often called the closing string. Um, the closing string or missing string finishes the whole thing off. Now, that's going out really dark compared to the others. So that's the closing string or missing string because it's not there, it is, it's not missing. It's, it, that's why closing, I prefer closing, but anyway, I've written missing now. There's the closing string, missing string. That now gets transferred back. Let me line that up again. Get our set square back in here. Our slider, hold it all together. Good. Well, I just had it sitting on top of it there a bit. Right, now slide that up until I get to point P. Put that one in. I should have put P over here for us before. So that then breaks the height of the two. And that will be the length of R, B, V and R, A. Right, so that's an M, S. Missing string, closing string. That's the way it's done. Looks a bit fancy. All right. it took like a while to do. And you're going to say, that's not faster than doing it analytically. Well, I'd like to challenge you to try them both ways. Once you get used to doing this, personally, I find this very quick. Now, how accurate is it? Well, it's going to depend on how big the scale is. And we analytically calculated some four sizes here. And I'm going to read that one as 13 point, uh, probably two. Remember I had my scale, my scale over here should write that down too so you don't forget it. In this case, it was one centimeter equals one kilonewton. So I've got 13.2 kilonewtons. So RAV, I'm reading as 13.2 kilonewtons. And then I go over here and I read this has 10 point, well, 10.8. Again, thickness of the pen is not helping. So R, B, B, 10. Just double check that, yep. Yep, 10.8, 10.8. And if I grab those notes that we had, let's have a quick look. I can't even remember what they were. For this one, 13.5, 13.57. This is analytically. I've got 13.2. That's well within the range of being 5% you know, either side. And 10.43, 10.8, well clearly if I've got to add up, so they're, they're both gonna be okay. It's not dead accurate. I mean, it's out by 0.4, and this one's out by, yeah, well, obviously 0.4 again, but that's close enough. And you can see the method would work. And of course, if I was, wasn't doing this on a table, it was moving around and knocking legs on, on things, and I'd be able to do that a lot more neater and make sure I had it right. Okay. You probably need to watch that a couple of times to make sure you know how it was done. You can always do that with a video, which is really cool. I'll do the third one, the third video, which brings in the angles. So that'll, so you can stop this one, have a go at it. Try the ones in the questions that are vertical. So if you go to the questions, find all the vertical ones, try them a couple of times and you should be able to do these quite easily. Okay.